Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another exciting session of Android programming stuff. Um, I don't actually think I have any, uh, you know, business or business or whatever. Um, if you're still behind on the homework and, uh, for the first application and you finish it up and want to send it over to us, we'll be glad to look at it. We've only had a couple people who've actually submitted anything, so um, you know, if you feel free to get it. I mean, this is a uh, you know, this is the time to, you know, help us help you because <laughs> we haven't seen any of your code, so we don't know if you guys are doing something wrong or, you know, listening to random weird people on Stack Overflow who are doing it wrong or something like that. So um, feel free to send that in if you can. And if not, I, I will um, jump right into things. So first off, public disclaimer because I don't like getting credit for things that I didn't actually do. Um, preparing uh, all these, all the code samples that you're going to see was all Amir. And I, I'm doing production deployments this whole week and uh, even later tonight, so um, I didn't have time to put all this together, so Amir uh, definitely saved us all uh, by putting this all together. If it works. Yeah, well, it, it worked when we were testing it earlier, so hopefully, <laughs> hopefully everything's good. But um, uh, one of the questions that we did have in the office hours that I thought I'd mention, because it was a really good question, uh, was from Rick Wyckoff, who asked, um, uh, is how does... how The two pane view and where it's doing the single pane view because it, it there is no code that actually has that anywhere in the project and uh, you know since that was a good enough question that I even ha I even had to look it up because I wasn't really sure um, so what you have that it determines it with is you have these three uh, values here these values folders so we talked about these before and we said that there was you know we've got our strings and then we've got our styles sitting throughout here. Well, what we also have with this master detail view is we have a this values large and values SW600 DP, which also have a couple of uh, XML files in them. So if you look at what these refs are, when we open them up, you'll see that if I look at the actual XML, it's saying this is a layout alias that replaces the single pane version of the layout with the two pane version on large screens. So we talked about earlier about uh, in the last session about how you can have support for only certain screen res screen resolutions and screen sizes. This is what this is using that in kind of a more subtle approach. So what this is is a layout alias that says, okay, if the the device reports that its screen size is large, go ahead and load up this refs XML file versus any of the other ones. So using this allows us to have a different layout just for that one screen. So if you look at kind of the wider application of this beyond just the master detail layout, this actually lets you tweak your, your layouts just a little bit if you need to, um, say, support uh, maybe hiding certain items on smaller screens or uh, flowing, you know, maybe flowing over and, and having a smaller width uh, version versus a larger width. And you can do that not only with device size, which is typically the physical size of the device, but also with the dev uh, device pixels or density pixels, I don't remember which one this DP is supposed to be for, but um, if you look at both of these, they're exactly the same. So you could actually, if you wanted to say, uh, we want to change this from uh, showing the two pane on just large devices to pretty much every device, you could actually hack that together just by renaming this folder to values-small, and Android will interpret that uh, and make it so that you're going to see the two pane layout on everything. Now, of course, I don't recommend doing that because it's going to look completely weird. But um, one of the uh, weird cases is that that kind of seven inch uh, tablet, so your Nexus sevens and uh, Galaxy Tab sevens. That's usually where people have a little confusion. Is it good? To, is it better to have a um, you know the, the the tablet view or to have the phone view? Um, personally. For my just kind of my personal preferences, I say it's a tablet and it should have the tablet view. Um, but I know some people think that that just doesn't have enough width to it to um, really show it. And it depends a lot on your fragments and your layouts. But um, thus, you will see uh, some applications will display as a tablet on that, and other ones will display as a um, phone application. So um, that was a good, really good question from Rick. So I'm glad he asked it, so I can mention that. Um, if you need to look it up, uh, you can look it up under the, the technical term layout aliases, and that has, um, there's a file, I think, in the Android guides that talks about um, setting those up and what they all mean and everything like that. 
Can you show them the onCreate method for that uh, activity where it checks to see? So uh, they can reference it in the code. Should we post uh, this? Yeah, so that was a, that was a good point. Um, so on our, whoops, we need our post list activity. Um, right there, yeah. Uh, back up. Okay, so on create, you'll see it's doing this find view by ID, RID post detail container. So what this is doing is it's looking for a specific ID that should be instantiated when we've called the set create or set content view when we inflated that XML. If, this do, if it doesn't find this, what it does is it returns it as a null value. So um, this is, this post detail container is only viewable, you only see this when you're in the two pane view uh, because it's loaded up that second fragment, our post detail fragment. So if it doesn't find that, then, um, and, and that is null, then we're in single pane view. If it does find it, then we're in this two pane view. So what it does is it sets this variable that throughout the rest of the time you can say whether you're in two pane or single pane, uh, which you only really have to worry about for this activity since it will handle the interaction between those two fragments. Uh, if you were in the post detail activity, that's only going to get instantiated in the uh, single pane view. So you don't have to do any of this checking if it's one pane or two pane. So with that, uh, we'll go on to what we're going to be covering today, which is storage, storage, and more storage. So um, up until now, when we've been making these applications, what we've been doing is we've been pulling data off the internet, and uh, we haven't been doing anything with it. It just lives in RAM. So every time you open up the application, every time you instantiate a view, you know, every time that an onCreate is called, it goes in and it's uh, pulling all the data. Again, so that's really not that efficient. You know, I mean, for depending on what you're doing, um, maybe you want to make it so you can actually use your application offline. Uh, maybe it's uh, important that you be able to save things like user preferences. So um, there's a couple of different approaches on how you can do that. Um, each one has the pros and cons. So I'm going to go through all of them uh, conceptually, and then we're actually going to look at um, a how to do SQLite so you can actually do a database for your application, which is what you guys are going to be doing for homework. So um, when talking about the storage options, um, I just mentioned that you can do SQLite. What that is is uh, if you're used to SQL Server or Oracle or you know any other kind of relational database, it's just another relational database. Um, the advantage of SQLite is that it is very lightweight. Uh, pretty efficient even on mobile devices. Um, you do get the same querying ability, you know, foreign keys, all of that great stuff that you're used to in regular SQL, but um, what they've done is they've pared down the number of data types and some of the more advanced things that you would be doing, so I don't believe you can do any real like stored procedures or triggers or anything kind of advanced like that, but for general querying, it gives you great support. Um, I think the basic data types are like it's a, it's going to be an integer or floating point number, uh, text and blob it, and blob. There you go. So with those data types, you can represent most of the data that you would need. So um, you know there is no difference between an n32 versus a um, you know float 64 or anything kind of fancy like that. Um, it keeps it pretty simple on the data types, which makes the uh, checking easier. So um, what that does, and if you remember back to the um, architecture document way back when, you know, over a month ago, month and a half now, uh, we were talking about at the boot camp when I talked about that the SQLite database is one of the C plugins. So your SQLite uh, queries when you're running them, they run at C speed. They don't run at Java speed. So what, it's do what the Java API does is it takes it and just passes it straight on to the C SQLite database, which then runs it and returns it back. So you get very fast performance on this, um, you know, much faster than if they had done it maybe as a Java implementation, uh, which there is Java SQLite implementations. You can run SQLite on anything. So um, it's very fast, and the best part is it's, it's low level. So you can, if you can write a query for it, and uh, you can copy that query, put it into this, as you'll see we do later, and um, run it. So it's very easy to, it's pretty easy to debug, it's pretty easy to experiment with. Um, there are some sticking points, which I'll get into when we start looking at um, the actual database code. But um, for now, just know that that's one of the better ways that you can take, uh, especially complex data, that um, isn't like an image or anything like that, and store it, is a SQLite 
database, especially if you need querying and things like that. Um, so there's there's two types of file storage if you're talking about like you know actually storing it onto a disk. Uh, so there is internal storage and external storage. Now internal storage is storage that is you know soldered onto the the chips on your phone, uh, you know basically your hard drive. So with the internal storage, the advantage that you get is that it's sandboxed. So you're you're actually going to be writing to your uh, own file store, if you will, that no other application has access to due to how uh, Android does its Linux permissions. It gives only your application access to those files. Now you can share them out if you want to, um, but basically by default it's going to be uh, this basically the secure way to store data if you need to uh, actually put it out into a file. The disadvantage that you're going to find is that there's fairly limited storage. So if we look at the uh, say the new Samsung Galaxy S4, it only had eight. It only comes with eight gigabytes of uh, usable storage on say the 16 gigabyte model. So if you keep in mind that every application and you may have you know 50 applications that all write uh, you know say 100 megs of data, uh, that'll fill up pretty quickly. So um, generally you want to try to keep it. Be a little respectful of the fact that um, that's not an infinite amount of storage, and that's um, you know you can't expand that storage. There's no way to get more of that storage than to buy a new phone. So um, typically, if you take um, if you, especially if you're writing enterprise applications and you have an application that you want to um, say securely store the data, you're going to want to put it on the internal storage or on the SQLite database, which also has that same sandboxing rule around it. Because of um, if you if you want to get into the architecture of SQLite, SQLite writes everything into a flat file, so um, you can actually per, uh, you know protect your database just by this you know the same way of just setting permissions like you would on a file. Um, so the other type of storage is the external storage, which is the SD card. So um, except for tablets, which some of them don't have SD cards, um, every Phone that I've ever seen has an SD card on it. Uh, that's your expandable storage. Um, the the disadvantages primarily is that that's public storage, so anybody can see it. If you go and download any of the File Explorer applications, they can open up and view any SD card file, no problem. Um, you know, copy them, delete them, anything like that. And uh, so, it's you know, it's not the best place to be writing your data if you're worried about other applications tampering with it, but on the other hand, if you would prefer your applications have access, or other applications have access to that data, that's a good way that you can expose it um, in a way that doesn't mean that you're having to do things like writing intents to handle the files being accessed and all of that, which would be, I guess, kind of messy, but a way you could do it if you wanted to have internal storage. Uh, one of the other things to keep in mind is that um, with the external storage, uh, there is no way of, ca of writing a cache. So I mean, with internal storage, you can actually set up a, um, a cache directory, uh, which is a special permission. And what that will do is actually open up a file that lets you put other files inside of it. And what Android's system will do is whenever it starts needing to open up space on the internal storage, uh, it'll start asking applications to delete their cache files. So um, you can do that if you if you're not worried about the data getting over uh, deleted or over otherwise overridden with some other data. But um, on the external MIP card, anything that you put on there is going to be how it is. Um, so pretty much, um, like I said, it's public. But uh, the other thing is that uh, you have to check to see if that SD card is actually there because uh, while some phones don't allow it just from the physical way they're constructed you can hot swap the um, SD cards so you could pop it out and pop it back in on any write. So uh, typically what you'll do is you will actually do a check to see if the media has been uh, inserted and mounted properly and then uh, when you have that uh, write permission and you know that you can actually write into it then you'll actually write your data. Um, pretty easy stuff to do. Um, we're not going to show you guys how to do that because um, they actually have pretty good documentation on it. There's, I mean, plenty of stuff online and it just didn't fit into the application that we're writing so um, just know that that's something that you can do. Um, see if there was anything that I needed to be marking. Uh, let's see. Uh, 
Actually, I was wrong. I'm actually looking at the notes here, and you can create a cache file even on the external storage as well. So um, I stand corrected. You can do a cache file on either the internal or external storage. So um, something to keep in mind. Uh, I guess you do need a little bit more data to be cached on there. Um, so the, the last piece uh, or last method of storing data that you have is to actually use what's called the uh, shared preferences. And what shared preferences are is if you have SQLite as your relational database, uh, you could look at shared preferences as kind of your non-relational database. Um, really what it is is it's a key value store, so think of like a giant dictionary that you can put keys and values into. So what you can do with that and what you typically would be doing with it is you put in your preferences or any settings that you're going to have for your application. That's uh, probably the most common use case for it. So uh, for instance, if you had to um, store, say, a username and password for a user within your application, you might put it in there. Or you might um, you know, maybe have a, a Boolean value for whether some you know, checkbox is checked or something like that within your settings menu that you could then access later. Uh, since that is a, you know, that's global within your application, so you can access that from any activity and pull those preferences in to, you know, drive your application logic. So um, with all of that, let's see, make sure I'm checking my notes here to make sure that I got every everything I wanted to mention. That was it. So I will let you guys uh, stop for a second and let you guys uh, ask any questions if you have anything about the differences between all of those and kind of when you should be using them. I've got no questions so far. We have one correction. Ethan wanted to mention that the Nexus devices don't contain SD card slots. Uh, so yeah, there are some devices out there that don't have SD card slots. The, wait, uh, the Nexus phones don't have SD cards? Uh, no, it's all internal storage. Uh, wow. But I think, I think the way that it's partitioned, it still says like SD card. Uh, so. Oh, that yeah, that's another good one that I've seen. Also, um, when I had a, a G2X, there was actually a. Um, it had two ex two SD cards. It had an internal and an external SD card, and I think that's the same thing that the Nexus does. Mm -hmm. So you'd still want to write your application so that it does that same checking, but it would just always return true on that case. Yeah. Bar, so I guess we can move on. Okay, cool. So, um, so if you guys didn't get a chance to um, go through the application and uh, write the um, uh, write your RSS reader, I'll actually show you what you guys should have been building. Since Samir put good time into this, and we'll show it off. So, um, by default, what this does is it populates this list view, and despite how big this looks on my screen, this is actually a. Um, oops, go back. This is actually the phone view, not the tablet. Um, on the tablet, you should see them on the two panes. But if I try to pull that up, that's going to be huge because this is a this is a representation of a four-inch phone, which completely fills my screen. But uh, he parses the RSS feed, like you'd see. So this is the uh, Lifehacker news feed here. And if we look and oh hey, there's an article I'd like to read, and we click on it, what it's going to do is open up that post detail. And I would have to pick the one that doesn't actually render anything for whatever reason. And try to pick one here that actually has pictures and things on it. Yeah, there it goes. And you'll see he takes the uh, the HTML that their body of their post has, and he actually threw it into a web view. So um, basically, think of web views like uh, web browser windows. So um, what he's done is this is a you know just just the straight HTML put in here, which is how you can see there's some uh, these symbols that don't look right and things like that. Um, because they haven't been converted back into their HTML representations from the XML representations. So um, this is pretty much how every RSS reader I've seen does it. Uh, the only difference is that they inject a little bit of their own HTML for um, basic theming. So you can see, like, I can scroll up and right on here, and you might not want to do that or anything like that. But overall, this is exactly what you should be seeing. So you can see how um, you know, it renders pretty much like you'd expect it to. If you were to uh, pull it up in your RSS reader, you'll see it looks almost exactly the same. Um, especially when we get to the bottom here, you can you know all the links are actually work. So if we actually if I click one of these, let's see if it yeah it opens up in an external link. Good. So apparently I'm also downloading the picture now. 
So um, that's basically what you're going to be built. That's what basically what you will be building. Um, the only difference from what the homework was was I didn't tell you guys to go ahead and render it. If you, but um, web views are how you would be rendering that. So spoiler. <laughs> but um, so let's start looking at some of the code here. So you'll see we've got our post list activity, and if we kind of scroll through this, there's nothing that's been changed in this. So that stayed all the same, and uh, what Amir did was put everything inside of the fragment itself so that all the logic and all the, the controls for it are all um, you know, put in here into this fragment so they could be reused if you needed to put it into um, a different page somewhere. Say, for instance, if uh, you, know, you wanted to rewrite the application and you wanted to add that little Facebook thing where it'll pop out from the side, you could treat that as a fragment and reuse this list fragment and populate it in there. So um, pretty good way of putting it all together, I would say. I think so, your video may have frozen because well, I'm not seeing did. your mouse move up and it just picked back up. Oh, and it would do that right as I go ahead and kill it to restart it here. There we go. There we go. All right, cool. So come back here. What we'll see is when he instantiates the fragment on the onCreate method, he's got this uh, you know, blog content dot items right here. So that's a singleton that represents all of his, um, you know, the content of the blogs, which are put into their own objects. So he's got, okay, well, if we don't have anything in there, go ahead and call this populate data function, and then he set it up with a new array adapter that's going to have the blog content items in there. So we go ahead and go down to his, uh, I think everything else here was pretty much the same. If we go down to the, um, do, 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 uh, the very bottom, yeah, here on the populate data function, You'll see he's using the same uh, async HTTP client library that we were using before. And going in there, and what he does is go, in, go ahead and not only is he grabbing the blog content data, he's also get, putting together a database helper, which we'll talk about in a minute. And uh, going ahead and creating the table of that for uh, the application. So then you use the document builder factory here, which is going to help him, uh, it helps the parsing. So we get a little try catch action here, and then actually go through and build the uh, response using string readers into an input source into the builder, and then you just parse this XML. Um, this is pretty simple. Luckily, the RS, that RSS feed is pretty easy to to go through. You can see how he's getting the you know the GUID, the title, and the description, and the description is the is the actual body of the uh, XML feed. And then adding that to a blog post, which then gets added into your blog content, uh, so, yeah, blog content object, and also inserting it into the database here, so that you have an offline data store. So um, I'm trying to see if oh yeah, here we go. So when when you have the on failure function get called, that's what happens when you don't have a data connection, typically, or a, you know you get a I think a 500, 404, or something like that. Um, so what he's done is he's taken it and said, okay, well, you know what, if, that, if the data doesn't work and we can't get it from the remote source, who cares, we'll just use the, we'll just use the pre-cached data. So you can see here, gets the blog post out of the database, puts it into the list view, you know, adds the blog contents in there, and uh, because this is tied to uh, the array adapter for the um, view, it's going to automatically make everything show up. So... Um, Pretty, pretty schnazzy. I have to say that's, that's probably pretty much the best way you can do it. Um, so nothing too fancy, nothing we haven't really seen before because we're kind of abstracting away all of the um, database operations. So what Amir did was um, take the, all the database stuff and put it in its own helper class. And this is a really good way of breaking up the logic. Um, the only uh, thing I think he, he even admitted he didn't do was do this asynchronously. But... Um, I mean, I wouldn't worry too much about that with um, doing one RSS feed, but if you were doing, you know, several hundred, that might become a problem. Uh, so we'll go through this real quick. Um, so one thing to keep in mind when you're doing the databases is uh, it's good to extend the, I don't remember which, what is it called, the SQLite Open Helper uh, class. So you would do, you know, uh, say that's the best way to do it, especially when um, you're talking about creating databases, because 
what it'll do is it'll help you uh, with doing things like versioning and migrating your databases to different versions whenever you update your application. So that's always a good idea to do. Uh, you've got, we got a couple strings here, and then um, we get right into the into things. So first thing is go ahead and open and create the database and set it to private so that it's not read public. It's not public. Um, so you can see how you can set it to uh, world readable and world writable. Uh, world writable, I believe, also makes it world readable. I think that would kind of be necessary, but I'm not 100% sure. I'm pretty sure it does. Um, but by default, you'll usually always make it private, um, just for good sandboxing. You can see he's got his uh, create table function here, and pretty much just puts it in a try catch to make sure that uh, you actually can create that database, and uh, you know create and drop the tables, or actually create the tables, and then uh, you've got a couple helper functions here. You got to see if the table exists, and uh, if you actually look, that's just straight. That's just straight SQL. That's more or less what you would see in any other SQL. Um, so this is pretty much how you do it. I'm not 100% certain if anybody's actually written a um, Android ORM for the SQLite database, but um, you really don't need it for most things because these are pretty basic queries that you're writing. So nothing too fancy if you've done SQL before. Uh, you'll see here's one to check if a post exists. Pass in the GUID and check it. Um, you know, to remove a post, to get all the posts, just a simple select there. And uh, I'm trying to see if there's actually anything fancy here. Um, I don't know if you want to explain the cursor as aspect. So when you do a query, you get back a cursor, and then you. Oh, uh, that's that's a good point. Um, if you haven't, if you're not, well, actually, I mean, I think C# -sharp probably does the same thing where it gives you back a cursor or uh, an iterator of some type. Uh, usually you'll get that, or depending on your language, sometimes you get back an array. Um, but if you get a cursor, basically the, uh, I mean a cursor works like any other type of iterator, you would iterate over it. Um, and so what he's doing is he's going through and iterating over everything to... Um, oh, we lost your video feed again. Oh no. It's not having a good... And that was my plugin crashing. So um, restart that, and hopefully it doesn't crash again. <laughs> <laughs> so um, one of the things that Amir did differently that you may or may not want to do, it just depends on um, what kind of data you're trying to store, is he actually serializes the um, the de uh, the the data. So the actual was it the actual? Did you serialize the whole thing, or was it just the? Uh, oh yeah, you serialized the yeah. whole thing. So. Yeah, so I pulled, was take it. Uh, oh, pulled, yeah, go ahead and explain it there. Yeah, I, I pulled the GUID out, and I'd indexed on the GUID, and then I put the whole object serialized as an object. So, you know, it's not traditionally what you would do, but, uh, you know, it, it's just one way to do it if you want to just dump the whole object into the database. Uh, it's also good if you wanted to play shoehorn the non-relational data store or data <laughs> object into a, a, a relational data store. Yes. So, um... That's one. That's something to keep in mind um, when you're doing this serialized object. Uh, your object that you're serializing, you just need to tell it to extend serializable, just like you would, um, I think, in regular Java. If you're doing a web service, I'm pretty sure you have to do the same thing. Last I checked, um, so he's just getting the blob, and then uh, you know, using these read serialized object. I think he's got another one to actually when he writes one here in the insert. Yeah, to get serialized object and. Uh, those are pretty basic. You can find those online, uh, which I think is the easiest way to do it for little helper functions like that. And um, after adding it to that list, you know, you got the do while loop, and then you just return that. So um, pretty basic stuff. I mean, that's, that's the, the real easy part about the file I.O. and the general you know, data storage side of things in Android is it's pretty easy. I mean, I remember when I first learned how to do uh, you know, file I/O in Java. You know, for regular files on on a desktop, and I was just, you know, feeling like it was just way too complicated. And this is pretty basic. Um, pretty much the same thing would happen if you were going to do a flat file. You need to open up a, you know, input stream into it. You know, dump in all your uh, data as a string, and then it would, you know, write out to the file for you. So um, 
what you guys are going to be doing is actually going and writing this same kind of thing where you have a helper to do everything and uh, do the database action. If you want to go ahead and serialize it, since Samir did it, makes it okay. <laughs> and, you know, just put it all into a blob. Or if you guys want to actually store all the metadata and everything uh, for kicks and giggles, uh, you know, you're more than welcome to. Uh, just leave it kind of open. The main thing is that it works. It means that you can read your RSS feed when you're offline. Um, one thing you might also want to do if you wanted to kind of go the extra mile is to put a flag in there that you can toggle to uh, mark as red and mark as unread. So once you click on it, uh, you mark it as red in the database to keep track of everything. But um, that's pretty much it for the database helper. Um, we'll go ahead and pause and see if you guys have any questions about that before I go on to our last bit here, which is the actual content object. Uh, we have nothing so far. I'll keep an eye on it, though. Okay, well, while you guys are enthralled by the very interesting discussion that we're having here, uh, we'll go ahead and do the attendance, and I'm going to play Look Around to see what I can use for inspiration for the word of the day. Let's have the word of the day be box, B-O-X, because that's the only thing in this room that I haven't used as a name of something, so box it is. Go ahead and send that to me when you guys get a chance. So you can be marked as attending. And uh, if you guys don't have any questions, we'll go to this last bit, and we may actually get out early. Yep, no questions so far. Cool. Well, I'm glad that you guys are getting the hang of this. Hopefully becoming a little bit easier, uh, especially if you're from the Java, Java land. This is, um, this is so far been pretty basic, I think. So um, but what Amir did was he just took the same dummy file and just went ahead and changed it. So um, you can see he's got you know, a couple of imports that he added and uh, all that. So first thing you'll see is you've still got the array list here. Uh, here's your blog content dot items right there. And then uh, you know he's got his map and then the add items function. And right here you see actually, here's your actual blog post uh, object. These are what actually get, get serialized in the database, hence why they uh, implement the serializable interface. So we've got a constructor, we've got a two-string method. Woo! Yeah, I mean this is, <laughs> you know, this is pretty. This is pretty easy. Um, I think Amir did a fantastic job on this. A plus helps that he's also doing an application that's very similar to this so, <laughs> for yeah. a client, so he he got to cheat. <laughs> uh, I guess the only thing I would add is uh, that it was weird in this one. If you scroll up. Um, yeah, so you see that they add the items, and this is the way the default one did it. They add it to a, a list, and then they also add it to a map. Um, and I think that has something to do with uh, referencing it like once it's been clicked on the master detail view. Uh, you could probably edit the code to only use one or the other, but the template does have both in there. So you see items and item map. Uh, yeah, you would have to do it that way. Uh, otherwise, what you'd have to do is you'd iterate through this until you found the one that had the, uh, the ID that you wanted. So yeah, the hash map uh, yep. there just makes it index faster, which is good for bigger lists. Yep. Um, um, one thing also that I'll keep in mind, I'll, I'll let you guys know of, is the performance on uh, huge lists. If you take a massive list, um, yes, it's going to slow down. <laughs> uh, there is a, I'm guessing it's patented because I would think Google would do it if it wasn't, but on iOS, they've got this nifty little trick that they do where they um, actually dereference the uh, list items. They may have, like, say, if there's five of them that show up on the view, they'll have maybe 15 objects, and they just change out. They, they, if you start scrolling, it pops ones off the, off the top and puts them on the bottom of the list and then populates it with the data that would belong in that position if that makes any sense. Uh, so it only has, uh, you know, 20 items, even though there may be a representation of 150 million items, for all you know, which is why you'll never see the same performance problems in Android that you do on iOS. Uh, it was a nifty little trick that they came up with. But um, if you do instantiate a, a crazy size list, uh, what's going to happen is you're going to um, start taxing the memory. And keep in mind, we're talking about, you know, either very, very rich lists where you've put a lot of um, custom content in there 
maybe um, you know a lot of styling and things to make the uh, the memory size of that individual item a bit larger than just the text that we've got. Um, now, because it doesn't do that by default, that doesn't mean you couldn't figure out a way to uh, implement a similar strategy where you started or you know dereferencing things. And one of the ways you could do that is to keep this array list right here, which is actually tied to the physical list that's being seen on the screen, and only populate that with ones that need to be shown. Um, I haven't tried this. This is one of those since I learned that that's how iOS does it. I've wanted to try it and see what would happen. But um, just keep in mind that um, that everything is is instantiated when it uh, ties into this array list. So um, if you look, actually, that's a good example. If you look at um, any of the RSS readers, they don't put everything in the RSS feeds on the into these array lists at once. I think the Google Reader one by by default does them uh, twenty at a time. And if you look at say the Feedly app, I think Feedly is only doing them. Assuming that it also instantiates the like it, it does them in chunks of I think five to five to eight articles depending on your screen resolution, and when you flick to switch between the quote unquote pages in Feedly, um, what it's doing is it's it's uh, dereferencing the ones that are not in view anymore and taking them out of this array list. So uh, that's that's me attempting to reverse engineer it without having actually dug through their code at all. So that's just how I would do it, kind of in my head. So I'm spitballing this to eat up time so you guys don't feel like you're getting gypped on this lesson that uh, went really, really fast. <laughs> so uh, I guess, I, don't, I mean, I don't have anything else. So um, if you guys don't have any questions, we will go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, homework's basically going to be a catch up to what Amir's got here. Uh, add in the database helper and tie it in so that everything works online and offline. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't have any questions so far. If y'all want bonus points, you could do all the database read writes asynchronously using, like, um, where is it, the, the um, uh, asynchronous tasks they are in Android. And if you Google that, you can find a lot of help with that. Because uh, even on this one, when it starts writing a ton to the database, it's, I think, pulling 20 posts or 25 at a time. Uh, if your internet connection's, like, Actually, it's not an internet connection, but if you do wind up pulling a lot of data, it may lag out just a little bit. Um, I didn't have it crash on my end yet, but I'm sure that if it was uh, large enough, it would it would throw a not responding. Yeah, um, another bonus point would be um, he doesn't, uh, the one that he's put together doesn't take the pictures and offline those as well. Uh, if you wanted to, if this was going to be like a, um, you call it the production application, what you'd want to do is when you're parsing out the XML feed, you'd want to look through there for all the image tags and go ahead and pull all those pictures down and store them on either the internal or external storage and uh, or maybe even to a cache file and uh, provide that so that um, they'd still be able to look at the pictures even if they were offline, which I'm pretty sure, I, th I know the Google Reader one used to do that. I don't know if the other ones do or not. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they do. Yeah, so that's another thing that, that's one of those, uh, you know, bonus points. Uh, you'd probably do it if you were actually building this for a client kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Although I wonder if there's a way to get the web view to automatically do that for you. I'm not sure. I guess um, you'd, ha you'd you have to You could do that, first, but you'd ha yeah, you'd have to instantiate it. What you would do is in HTML5, uh, you can have offline assets using a manifest file. And what that is is that's a list that you keep that says, here's all the assets that it takes to represent this page that I want there to be whenever you go offline. Um, you'd have to set that up on your web server or, or basically like trick it into knowing that that file was there. Yeah, and first you'd have to go to all the articles you want to, so that's probably not the best way to do it. Yeah, it would, it would be tough. <laughs> so uh, probably not the most recommended way of doing it, but a uh, good idea actually. Uh, that's one of those uh, things if you were doing an HTML5 reader, you would probably do something like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so since nobody else has any questions, yeah. I suppose we will end early and uh, let you guys get out of the way and I'll get on to getting ready for my production deployment that starts at 11. Yay! <laughs> so I will see you all later. Thank you for 
coming out once again. Don't forget to send the attendance word. Yep, so and don't forget office hours if y'all are having any problems. Uh, we only had one person come in and hang out with us uh, yesterday, so we expect more people next week. Yeah. Again, we don't bite. We're, um, you know, we're friendly. <laughs> we're here to help. So, mm -hmm. like, I mean, you know, uh, you know, if you guys are, are stuck on something, or even if you just want to come, like, pick our brains about Android stuff, or even, I mean, hell, not Android stuff for that matter. Um, you know, we, when we're when we're not helping somebody, we just sit and chat. So, I mean, uh, you can ask Ethan if you guys know uh, Ethan, and he come he's come in a couple times and just hung out with us for a little bit, and uh, you know, just listen to us ramble. Yeah. So, if not, I am going to end the broadcast. And uh, if you guys don't come to Office Hours, we'll see you all next week.